So you're the new assistant here. It's glad to have some help around here. I am a bit of a clumsy sort, so any help would be necessary. You're probably going to be needing to help me very much after we're done here with your orientation. Because I just recently, once again, knocked down all the bookcases in the library. The director is going to kill me. Anyways, it's none of your concern. Now, how much experience do you have with the Egyptian culture or history? Okay, not very much. You were trained as a librarian. Here, let me simply get something. There we go. Better, isn't it? Now, you were trained as a librarian. Perfectly all right, those are the qualities that we were looking for. However, since we are working within the Museum of Antiquities, it would be preferred to have someone with an, a knowledge, back, a background on Egyptian culture, the knowledge in the history and whatnot. So, if you'd like, I can give you a rundown of some simple concepts, or one simple concept, so that way you can start familiarizing yourself with the information. Great. I think the first concept I'm going to start discussing is the... Well, we discussed the history at first. The history of Egyptology. The history of Egyptology started in the 1800s with Napoleon Bonaparte. He invaded the Egypt country and found the Rosetta Stone and wrote about it in the description de l'Egypte that um, basically detail the language and whatnot. Well, not detail the language, but the Rosetta Stone was the key to detailing the language for us. The We ended up getting our hands on it when we invaded Napoleon Bonaparte. And after we invaded Napoleon Bonaparte and obtained the Rosetta Stone, that's how modern Egyptology was birthed, to say. Now, with modern Egyptology, it is considered an academic discipline, or was considered an academic discipline. Yeah, let me continue brushing off my little box. Some people found it in an archaeological excavation of Peru. But the modern Egyptology, as we know it, was considered an academic discipline until the archaeologists decided to expand upon it, and now it's quite renowned for being an archaeological study. No, a friend gave this to me. It has nothing to do with the museum. She just wanted me to analyze it a little bit. Anyways, nonetheless. The excavation... Oh yeah. The Americans consider it to be something of an archaeological, simply archaeologically based. However, the Germans, the French, and the British obviously consider it to be more of an academic discipline. Something to branch within the philosophical language world the philosophy of language, while the Americans consider it more of a archaeological excavation, as I just said. They put it more into practical action, while we put it more into intellectual thought. It does go well with my husband and I's pattern, considering how my husband Rick is a, um, well, he's more of a, he, he, he definitely has more of a, action-oriented sort of side, while I'm more of a intellectual, let's actually preserve the history we're excavating side. Nonetheless, I've made up my mind to teach you the phonetic glyphs of Egypt, Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian language. Would that be alright with you? Yes. Excellent. Now, there are three types of hieroglyphs. The first being the one I'm going to teach you which is the phonetic glyphs, which are the single consonant characters that most resemble the alphabet that we use in common language. Um, those are the ones that you um, can see are easily translated. There are the logographs, which are... They could be either independent words, or they could be suffixes or prefixes within the English... I mean, not the English language, the Egyptian language. And then the third class are the determinatives, and the determinatives are the ones that classify the logographs and the phonetic glyphs into the categories that they end up classifying. 
So those are the three types. I'm going to be starting off with the most simple one, which is the phonetic glyphs. The phonetic glyphs, once more, are the ones that are more, in a way to express it, tangible to the already accustomed mind of someone used to the English alphabet, or the Roman alphabet, considering how that's where we got it from. Now, I'm going to be drawing the glyphs and noting down their representing letter. For the first one, it's going to be A. So, for A, I guess you can't see it. Let me simply detail it a little more. This is going, the lettering is going to look disturbed to say the least. But A represents the vulture. The vulture rather represents A. So, the vulture is a bird. There we go. Talking about birds, I recently found out that there's a word that means stalk, that is represented by a stalk. If we ever get into a conversation where where a stalk is represented in the books. I'll explain to you what the stalk means. The stalk, the, the stalk, the bird that carries babies in children's folk tales that parents tell their children in order to avoid the conversation. No. There we go. Don't forget the eye. So, this is the stalk the vulture and the letter it represents phonetically so if you were to see this character standing alone you would know that it would phonetically pronounce the letter A. Now before we continue on the assortment of these letters going together don't work as well as or don't work as you would believe them to be so if you were to for, ex for example use the um, character of F which is the viper and put it before or after the vulture symbol which is character for A as I just explained to print um you to for instance create the acronym AF or whatnot that wouldn't necessarily work because these are what it phonetically represents but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is how it is created not to mention you have to take into consideration the fact that it is a different language that doesn't work by our rules and terms especially since it is an ancient language of you know being aged many thousands of years while our language is only a couple of our modern day language is only 500 years old or 400 years old so you have to take that into consideration however these are what they phonetically mean if they were to be standing alone however you can't order them into representing a word that you would use in an english language unless of course you're trying to use your own code and trying to for instance write notes to your friend or something that um, is coded in such a way that you can still read it in an English language but so that way no one else kind of understands what is being said. Anyways, I was sidetracked. Oh wait, the point I wanted to make though is that the Egyptian language, the way you read hieroglyphs, is that it can be read, most of the time it is read from right to left in the Arabic fashion, oh, but there are times that it is read from left to right in the Western fashion, and there are other times where it is read from top to bottom. Now, once more, most of, the, most of the time it is read from left, right to left, right to left, right to left, right to left. But the way you determine which way the hieroglyphs are facing in order to read them is by the face of the animal being represented. So, for example, if all all of the all of the animals are going to be facing the same way, so if, for instance, the owl is facing to the left, then it is going to the left. If it is facing to the right, then it is going to the right. So the face, no, no, it faces where it begins. Yes. Yeah, so if the owl faces where it begins, yeah, the animals face where they begin. So if they are facing to the right, it began from the right, and if it faced to the left, they began from the left. And then, yeah. So now you understand the concept. Anyways, to continue on, I'm going to be trying the phonetic symbol for the letter B, and in the same way, just to keep as a note, and in the same way that. The letters in Russian or the letters in um, what other language? Well, let's just use Russian for a good enough example. They phonetically, the same way where there are certain letters that are missing from the alphabet, le from the alphabet, from the English alphabet. Um, the same case is going to be with the 
Egyptian alphabet. It is going to be missing certain letters within the English or phonetic letters within the English alphabet and they are going to be including some others that are combined. However, I'm going to be the R24 phonetic out letters within the Egyptian alphabet. So I'm going to be covering over 20. So I'm probably not going to be using any that are combined such as a sh sound or a th sound. But anyways, to continue on, I'm sidetracking myself so much. The next phonetic letter that is going to be represented is the letter, or the phonetic letter, the phonetic sound of B, as in boy. And this letter is represented by a leg. So the leg represents the B. So if you were to see this leg standing independently as its own character, you would know that it would be pronounced as B, B, as in boy. And as well with the vulture, if this was to be an independent character within, you know, some frame, then you would know it would be pronounced as R, as in apple. So, let me underline this and underline that. Now, the next letter, phonetic letter that is being represented, is D, as in dog. So, as you can see, the letter C has been skipped. Once more, these letters are going to be looking disturbed. Now, the symbol for D, as in dog, is the hand symbol. As you can see right there so D as in dog if you were to see this independent character the hand character by itself you would know that it would be phonetically pronounced as D as in dog now let me underline the D and then the next letter that we're going to be covering is F as in way, the way you phonetically pronounce or you know as in fish or the way you phonetically pronounce um, Philip so And that is going to be represented by the viper. But in all actuality, it looks like a slug. So. Now, there we go. So whenever you were to see this independent character standing alone, it is going to be representing the F character, or the F phonetically pronounced, so repeat with me if you were to see this, not those words, you know, after I say it. If you were to see this character, you would say F, so F, like Fish, or Philip, or Fontaine, or Phoenician. Now, the next one we're going to be going over is the letter G phonetically pronounced and it is going to be pronounced with a hard G like gorilla or gorgon or gone so and this is represented by it looks like a tent, but it's really a stand. So, there we go. And then, it even has a little door in it and whatnot. I use my own, within my own head, I use my own symbols for this or names for these, but they all look the same. However, I consider this to be more of a tent, but it represents a stand, so it's not a tent. As you can see, if you were to see a symbol like this, it would be a stand, 
L represent the phonetic symbol for G as in gorilla. So G as in gorilla or G as in Gorgon, like one of the Gorgon sisters from Greek mythology. The ones that include the mortal Medusa. And I forgot the other two names. All of the other two are immortals. Yeah. So the next letter that is going to be represented is H as in house or Homer. And the H is represented by a an intertwined rope, much like a pretzel. Okay. And put little circles within that. Make it as two dimensional as possible, little lines within it to represent the fact that it is a rope. This drawing is going to be quite poor, like all the other drawings. Okay. Now, if you were to see this character right here, let me bring it closer. If you were to see this character right here, then you would know that it would represent the phonetic symbol for H, or house, or home, or, or um... I was about to say something, but I'd rather not. So, that would be the phonetic symbol for it. So. The next letter that is going to be represented is I. So. I is going to be represented by a reed. Like the reeds that they find in the Nile. There we go. They use the reeds to make papyrus. Papyrus is what the Old Testament was written upon. The Old Testament from the Bible. There we go. So, if you were to see this symbol right here, then you would know that it will represent the phonetic symbol for I. So, igloo. Um, when you try to think of words that represent a letter that you're trying to find, it often escapes all of them. All of them escape. Um, is cyclades, I don't know. The first letter is really what it was what I was going for. Yes. So if you just see that, it would represent a. So a. Great. Now the next letter that is represented is J. So J is represented by a serpent, much like the letter F was only it's simply a serpent, nothing specific. And it looks like a serpent, unlike F, that look like a slug. Give it some scales. Okay, so. This is the symbol for J. This snake-like thing. And as you can see, the J, as in, well, to phonetically pronounce it, George, even though that begins with a G, but that is how you phonet phonetically pronounce J, or jumping jacks and whatnot. So this serpent right here, it seems like it's balanced upon some platform and the tail is falling down from it. But whenever you were to see this symbol, you would know that it would represent the single constant of J, so J, J, that is what it would pronounce. That is how you pronounce this character if you were to be standing alone within a frame. Let me underline the letter. And then K. So. K is going to be represented by a basket. This is the letter K, as in kangaroo, um, quality, even though that was spelled with a Q. And it rep when you see this symbol right here, when it looks like an upside down sunrise with a little circle tipping out of it, or a basket as it is supposed to represent, you would know that that symbol represents the phonetic sound of K, K, K. So. 
The next letter we're going to be discussing is L as in lion. So L is represented by, of course, the lion. So let me simply draw a lion. It's a lion reclining, one that matches the, the idea of a sphinx only without the head of a man. Let me underline the, le the letter L. So, as you can see, this is a lion without the head of a man as would be portrayed in a sphinx. So just imagine, when you're looking for the letter L, for instance, in some future reference, just remember that the letter L is represented by a lion, which is quite convenient. And also, the lion is reclining in a fashion that looks, is similar to the sphinx without the head of a man. So, this is the symbol for the letter L. And it phonetically stands for the letter L, so whenever you see the symbol, just think L, L, Lion. Very convenient. The next letter we're going to be discussing is the letter M. So, so far, these letters are quite following the same pattern as an English alphabet, so that is quite convenient. However, once more, we have to, remi I have to remind you that some of, these, some of the English letters won't be represented within the um, Egyptian phonetic pronunciations. So, the next letter is going to be M. M as in mouse or mermaids. And it is represented by an owl. letter M, and here's the owl that it represents, even though my drawing it makes it look more like a, a hybrid between a slug and a fox. But whenever you see the symbol of something similar to this, that is an, an owl, it represents the letter, phonetic letter of, or the pronunciation rather, I hit my drawing pad, the phonetic pronunciation of the letter M, so mother or man or mermaid. So say it with me when you see this character, this independent character standing alone within its own frame, it means mm, mother, man. This is an example. The next letter is going to be N. And the way I remember the character for N and the way you pronounce the character is because the character for N is water. And obviously Nile starts with an N, has water, and it's obviously a very memorable feature of the e of the Egyptian culture, considering how everything kind of revolved around the Nile River. So, their crops were due to the Nile. Their resources are found in the Nile. Okay, there we go. When if you were to see this character right here, even though it's quite messed up, you would say N mm, as in Nathan or um, Nostradamus or something. So the way, once more, that I remember it is that N starts off the word Nile, and Nile has water. And so you see, when you see a symbol that represents water, you know that it's going to represent the letter N. And when you see, when someone asks you which, what is the symbol for the phonetic pronunciation of the letter N, you would remember the water symbol, considering how they're interchangeable. Or not interchangeable, that's the incorrect word. They are... they represent one another. So, once more, when you see the symbol, you say, N, N, Nile. letter we're going to be discussing is the letter P, as in Penelope, Persephone. There we go. 
and this is going to be represented by a stool and not the stool of a biological function but the stool that is a piece of furniture okay so when you see this symbol of stool you're going to be thinking p as in persephone or penelope so when you see the symbol once more pronounce it with me p p persephone exactly one way you can remember it is that if you know there's another word that starts with p and is synonymous with stool though it's not the stool that is represented it is you know the word stool so you can associate the two together and that could be one way you remember the symbol now the next letter is q and that is represented by a hill so this letter is q and it is represented by a hill it looks like a throne and you could say it's a throne but it is a hill and i put some details in it to make it a bit darker as if it were you know made of dirt which it is and there we go and the way you would remember this is a bit difficult because there is really no association you can make out of this but just memorize it so whenever you see this symbol standing alone as an independent character within a frame just remember the queen or quail exactly quail or the queen so the next letter is R as in rat or roast and this is symbolized by the mouth symbol it looks a bit like a like a frisbee in my opinion like a sideways I don't know why I associate it with a frisbee but it looks like a frisbee so this letter whenever you see this independent character alone you associate it with the letter R or the phonetic pronunciation of R so rat or royalty or race car something like that something of that nature now it is represented by a mouth but it doesn't look like a mouth it just looks like a pointed circle or pointed oval rather within another pointed oval so whenever you see the symbol just associated with the letter R and it is phonetically pronounced this character is phonetically pronounced as R, R, royalty now the next letter is going to be the letter S and that is represented by a piece of cloth how it looks like a piece of cloth, I don't know, but it is supposed to represent a piece of cloth. So, there we go. And then it is going to be... There we go. If you were to give, if you were to ask me my honest opinion, it looks more like a cane. Like an old man's walking cane but it is supposed to be cloth so this is the letter it is phonetically this character is phonetically pronounced as as in snake or samuel or saratoga or not. and so whenever you see this character standing alone you associate it with the letter s because that is what it phonetically represents once again this is following the pattern of an English alphabet. The letters missing are C, O, A, B, C, D, E is also missing. B, Q, R, S, T, U, V, U, V, E, and C, and O are missing from this alphabet. So keep that in mind so that way you associate the fact that even though this is phonetically this does follow the phonetic um, alphabet that we use, just these characters because there are more um, 
and that this doesn't necessarily mean that there is an easy way an easy way to translate the English the ancient Egyptian alphabet into the English alphabet because that that direct correlation doesn't exist it can be similar in the sense of that we can correlate their ways of pronunciations with certain letters that we've created but the direct correlation is not a thing it's not accurate now the next letter is the letter T and it is represented by a loaf so now you see this it could be a loaf it could be the sun rising it could be simply the bug such as a roly-poly that is going to be representing the phonetic pronunciation of the letter T even though that looks like an I now so I do apologize for the confusion but it is going to be representing the phonetic pronunciation of the letter T so now if you see the symbol just think um to no but you pronounce that as to to Moses correct or Titan or um terrible so Titan or terrible or tor torment or t tent tent Mm. Those are good enough examples, so t -t 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 is going to be this character's representation. So t -t 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 is going to be the phonetic pronunciation of the letter T, and just associate these two together. So, low for sun rising represents t. Now, for the next character, it's going to be the character of W. So, as you know, we skipped over U and V. So. W is represented by a chick, such as a baby chicken. So. There we go. Okay. So, for this representation, it's going to be a little chick, as I already said. Ooh, this way. Nope. This is like, there we go. Eh, not really. The sun doesn't want. There we go, there we go. So it's going to be represented by a little chick, as in a baby chicken. Now the way you distinguish this character from the characters of M and A is that the A character obviously is represented by a vulture, but the vulture, hey, let me turn to it, it doesn't have a wing present within the actual portrait. I added the wing, but that wasn't supposed to be there. Let me simply erase it. Erase it poorly. So, this character doesn't have a wing present within it, so unlike the and its beak is also much thicker than the chick and it stands more upright it seems like a more mature bird just from the first glance while the chick has a skinnier beak and there is a triangular wing found right there so that is two ways that you can distinguish the letter W from the letter A and the way you distinguish the letter M from the letter A and W is that obviously letter A and M don't look at all like one another. Look at the letter M and the letter A. The letter A looks like, um, what's that bird called? It's a prehistoric, a prehistoric bird, but I forgot what the name was. Um, no, not coming to mind. So that looks like, you know, a proper bird while this one looks like it, even within the signature of the correct lettering of the letter M, it looks like a fox in my opinion. The face does look very fox-like. And it's facing forward. While the vulture and the the vulture and the chick are facing either to the left or the right, depending on where the uh, the sentence began. So that is how you distinguish those letterings from one another. Now 
to pronounce the letter W as I was about to go on. I lost my place in my own mind. To pronounce the letter W, w you would use, well, to pronounce this character within an independent frame, you would pronounce it the way you would pronounce the letter W. So, Washington, um, water, uh, west. So, that is how you would phonetically pronounce this character if you were to see it alone. So, the next letter we are going to be discussing is the letter Y, such as yellow. And this one, like the letter I, is going to be represented by a reed. However, for the letter Y, it is going to be represented by two reeds rather than just one, unlike the I, which is represented by one reed. So, to represent this character, it's going to be... There we go, with lines within it. It's not going to be triangular, I just got lazy and I decided not to put down the proper lines but the proper lines but it isn't supposed to be triangular it's supposed to be proper lines not triangular the second read would be better done just kidding it's not proper done there we go the lines are probably done within the second read but the shape is better done in the first read anyways oh let me underline it there we go so the letter y is what the phonetic pronunciation of the letter Y is the way you pronounce this character. It's a double read. Let me see if I can better. There we go. So whenever you see two reads together, yeah, let me flip back to the I because that was a better done read. Yeah. Whenever you see two of these standing right by each other, such as in the case of the letter Y, which why won't the sun go away then you would know that it represents the letter y the phonetic pronunciation so if you were to see this character independently framed within a frame then you would pronounce it as in ye, ye, yellow now for the last character we're going to be going over it is the character of z or z depending on how you pronounce it so z is going to be represented by a bolt. I have no idea how it looks like a bolt, but it is a bolt. However, in my opinion, it just looks like a rope with two bumps in it. It could be something within the electrical field, but I don't work within the electrical field. I work within the archaeological historical field within a library. So, it is no surprise that I would not know anything of the electrical field. The Z or Z is small compared to the other letters that I've written, but it is, it represents the Z. So, the letter Z is phonetically pronounced the same way this character is. It is considered a bolt, however, once more, it doesn't seem like a bolt to me. It seems like a rope with two bumps in it. And so when you were to see this character independently within a frame, you would know that it would mean the letter Z. So if you were to see that, you would know it means zoo or z Zanderfield is the next word that popped into mind for some reason. So, once more, pronounce it with me whenever you were to see this character. It would be z, z, zoo. Or zoology, considering how it's a study. So, these are all the characters that I can. That I'm going to be teaching you all the phonetic glyphs as I already explained to you. Once more, there's phonetic glyphs, logographs, and determinatives. Phonetic glyphs are the ones that I just showed you. Um, logographs are the independent, they could be independent words, however, they're not necessarily independent words, such as town and dog. Um, but they are suffixes and prefixes and things that are parts of the word and contribute to it as a whole. And the determinatives which classify the logographs and the um, phonetic glyphs. So, once more, just to give a recap on the letters that we've learned today. The first letter that we went over is the A, and the A is represented by vulture. So when you see this character, you say, ah, ah, apple. 
if you were to see the letter, rather this character, the leg, which is represented, which the letter B is represented by leg, if you were to see the leg independently or alone within a frame, you would pronounce it as b, b, boy. If you were to see the letter D, then you represent it by the symbol of hand or the hand symbol on its own, you would know that it would be pronounced as d, d, dog. And if you were to see the letter F standing alone, or rather the character of the letter F standing alone, which is the viper, then you would know that it would be pronounced as f, f, fish. If you were to let, see the letter G standing alone, you would know, or rather the character, the character for G that represents a G, which is the stand, you would know that it would be pronounced as g, g, gorilla. And if you were to see the letter H, which is represented by a rope, intertwined rope, you would know that this symbol means ha, ha, house. If you were to see the letter I, standing, or rather the character representing the letter I, standing alone, which is a reed, then you would know that it would be pronounced as uh, uh, igloo. If you were to see the let this serpent right here, it's just known as a serpent once more, it's not like a viper, anything specific. That looks like it is resting, that it looks like its stomach is re resting upon a platform while its tail hangs off the side, you would know that it would be pronounced as J, J, George, even though that name begins with the letter G, but I think it's just because I have King George on the mind. If you were to see the letter K, or rather this symbol, you know that it would represent the letter K, and it would be pronounced you know, the basket symbol, and it would be represent, pronounced as k, k, kangaroo. If you were to see the lion symbol, which is quite easy to determine that it represents the letter L, you would know that it would be pronounced as l, l, lion. If you were to see this symbol, I believe, yes, it was the owl. If you were to see the symbol of an owl, then you would know that it would represent the letter M, and it is pronounced as M, M, mother. And if you were to see the letter N, or rather this character, this squiggly line, this line that goes like this, it's not really squiggly line because that would be more rounded, but this pointy squiggly line, you know that that represents water, and that represents the letter N, and it is phonetically pronounced as N, N, Nile. to see this character right here, the P, rather this character, the stool, you would know that it would rep represent, my apology, I stumbled over my words, you would know that it would represent the letter P, which is phonetically pronounced as P, P, Persephone. If you were to see this hill-like thing, or this throne-like thing, depending on your own prerogative, you would know that it would represent, that it represents the letter Q, like queen, so Queen. If you were to see this R, then you would know that, or rather this ovular, pointy oval shape, then you would know, within another pointy oval shape, then you know that it would represent the letter R and would be pronounced as R, R, rat. And if you were to see this walking cane-like figure that is supposed to represent a cloth, then you know that it would represent the letter S, and it is phonetically pronounced as S, S, Samuel. Emotep. That was another example for the letter I. Oh, what a wasted opportunity. So, let me go back to that one, just because it was such a wasted opportunity. So, if you were to see this letter, you would think, uh, uh, Emotep. So, now going back to the T. Tutmosis. You could say, no, Tutmosis. Yes, that is the good, correct word to say, Tutmosis. Yes, yes. Okay. So, if you were to see this T, then, oh, okay, there you go. Now you can see the T. If you were to see this sunrise or loaf of bread or whatever your prerogative is, you would know that it would represent the letter T and the letter T. Um, and it would be pronounced phonetically as the letter T is, which would be Tutmosis. Tutmosis. Tutmosis, yes, Tutmosis, the King Tutmosis, or King Tut, 
as it's commonly known now. Now, the next. Did you know that King Tutmosis is simply known for being the, one of the first mummies to be discovered and having given a lot of insight to the archaeologists' discovery of the Egyptian culture or the ancient Egyptian culture, but for other than that, there really is no reason for him to be so well-renowned considering how he was only 20... no. Was he 22? No. He was young. He was young when he... he was, I believe, 13 or 14, maybe, when he ascended to the throne. And he died quite young, I think he was... he could have been 19, but I'm leaning more to, towards 22, but I could be off. And um, there is speculation as to how he died, though he was quite... he suffered the, the ailment that comes along with inbreeding, inbreeding rather. Considering how his family was all brothers and sisters marrying one another and cousins and whatnot, so obviously disease was rampant, biological genetic disease was rampant, but he suffered from those um, qualities considering how his spine was bent his he had poor health throughout his life and when he went on a hunt he was and this is the theory that goes but it is the most probable theory in theory it doesn't necessarily mean that it is some story or fantasy but it is a it is a tested hypothesis that has gone well with the results but it is a theory that he was on a hunt as was the culture back in the day and that Due to his ailments, he ended up being um, one of the slower ones, and as a result, when a hippopotamus came along, it squashed him, it sat on him, and caved his chest in, and that is how the archaeologists found Tutmosis, was that his chest was caved in, so that is the most probable cause of death for Tutmosis, that is quite a, a sad death, but it's not as sad as Emotep, which is the mummy that I discovered, and brought back from the dead, so... I'm pretty sure they didn't bring back Tutmosis from the dead, but I did. Not Tutmosis, but Imhotep. I brought back a mummy from the death. Take that. So, take that, scholars from Cambridge. So, W, that's what the letter we were on. So, W, there we go. So, W is represented by the chick, the baby chicken. And if you were to see the baby chicken standing alone, you would know that it represents the phonetic pronunciation of the letter W. So, whenever you see the symbol, just think, what? water. Let me go back. Now I'm thinking of good words to use. If you were to see this symbol, the owl symbol, you would think ma, ma, mummification. Or this letter, you would think a, uh, a, uh, archaeology. Now, going back to business. You would pronounce the baby chickens Whenever you see the baby chick standing alone, you would pronounce it as whoa, whoa, what, as we already went, as we already covered. Now the next one is the double reeds, which represent the letter Y, and they are phonetically pronounced as y, y, yellow. Oh my god, now I'm thinking of all these great examples. If you were to see the intertwined rope, you would think ha, ha, hamanaktra. And if you were to see this, Letter Z, that is considered a bolt, or being represented by a bolt, but really it's it looks like a, a rope with two knots in it. Then you would know whenever you see the symbol that it represents, that it is phonetically pronounced as Z, Z, Zoo, or Zoology. Z. There we go. Cambridge, and yeah, that could be a good pronunciation. If you were to see this basket, you would know that it would be phonetically pronounced as Cambridge. K -K Cambridge. Anyways, I taught you the phonetic glyphs of ancient hieroglyphics. There are some more that I didn't cover. The ones that are, for instance, like sh, th, the ones that have two letters intertwined to pronounce to create a different pronunciation. Those I skipped over, but it really is something you can delve into on your own. I mean, you are working at the Museum of Antiquities now, so it's not like you can't pick up a book and read it on your own as well. But I would highly encourage you now that you're working at the Museum of Antiquities to immerse yourself within the Egyptian culture, because though you could prove to be a great librarian, if you're working within this museum, it would be beneficial to learn a lot about the Egypt culture and whatnot, considering how we are in Egypt and the books here are representative of the fact. So, I'm 
simply food for thought, simply food for thought. Um, patience is a virtue, so if you, I won't be rushing you to learn as much as you can, as fast as you can, but I would encourage you to do so. Anyways, I'm going to be going back to my Peruvian box. I want to discover what's inside of it, what the symbols mean, and how I can best decipher it for my friend who works within the South American library. So, you can be on your way. I'm sure the director will be here any moment now to further orient you, orientate you. So, good luck.